Welcome everyone, Adam the Woo here. Now don't be afraid, do not be scared. We are heading down into the nether regions, crawling underneath the freeway. And on the opposite, this, this is just for dramatic effect, there's no real reason for this, but on the opposite side, after I engulf back into the light, we will be on the back side, not the Hollywood side, the Burbank side of Griffith Park. And I'm going to pay a visit today to what has become a yearly tradition. I went in 2015, 2016, and now for my first time of 2017. I'll see you over there. It's my second channel, Daily Vlog Channel. It's scary under here, the Daily. Ooh. Walt Disney's Barn. Free admission and free parking. Oh, boy, you're getting a yes, deal. Sticker. <laughs> and I like to leave a couple bucks to help out, help out the cause. I really do love this place. It's amazing how fast time just goes by. It's hard to believe it's been like 12 months since I paid my last visit. Even though this does say train crew only, Caleb here is going to give us the grand tour and let us on board, so. Come on in. As the conductor would say, all, all aboard. aboard. These were actually bus seats that were bought by Disney because how durable they are and just the right size. People would be sitting back here, basically. Right, right. Sitting and back this here is what, what is this called, a, co a combine car? Right, or combination car. A combination, a combination car. Of a freight car and a passenger car. This would be where all the baggage would be. So Walt Disney uh, had memories of being here as a child, and he wanted to build this. This truck right here, this was the sound system. All the sound system would be in here. Uh, these dynamite kegs are also original. Oh, yeah, you can see the speaker. Yep. Portal yeah, inside. there you go. This piece of wood here. Right, right. This is from one of the trains at Knott's Berry Farm. Now, I don't remember what train it was, but if you look back here, there's a five on it. Maybe someone could find an old picture where it shows a five, just, just a board on this, on the train at Knott's. Yeah, I heard that Walt used to actually go to Knott's. There was apartments for Walt Disney in the park. Yeah, see, I never knew that. That's interesting. They sadly turned that down, I think, last year. So you're about to break the internet with that fact. This is a section I have never even knew existed here. The miniature train that just runs around the perimeter, around the outside of where the barn is. Normally this area is blocked off, but today they have it accessible to anyone who wants to walk back here and see them operating. And this is very reminiscent of the train station that you see at Disneyland, right over near where you get the mint juleps. Looks eerily familiar. I always like the Ollie Johnston Depot. It's not a full size, it's a, not a miniature, but it's slightly smaller than one you would see in real life. And there is a burning candle down there which is also very similar to Walt's apartment above the fire station at Disneyland, which is always on in Remembrance. Of the two, do you get noticed more, recognized more for Andy Griffith, or do you get recognized more for Tinkerbell? Oh, Tinkerbell. So Tinkerbell's the most popular. Because there are promoters who put together things based around Tinkerbell. I am the original reference. I did all the posing and the dancing and the acting. That's my walk. So anytime you see Tinkerbell, the mannerisms, you created all it's, that. It's moi. It's moi. And the reason being is that, I, you know, at one time it was, it was Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn could have done it. I worked with her. I thought she was fabulous. You worked with Marilyn Monroe. Yes. And, uh, it, uh, but she was not a dancer at that time. And her part, Tinkerbell's part, needs so when they saw me at that, and they saw that I had the curves that went with her, and showed off my figure to best advantage, as the book says, <laughs> um, that they said, would it be convenient for you to come to work next Tuesday? But I'm also, you know, the red-headed mermaid in the lagoon, which then changed my career to voiceover. I remember that one of the uh, one of the mermaids, we just wanted to drown her. That was me. And then the other one, oh, Peter, we're so happy to see you. That was June Foray. 
who's a dear friend of mine, just passed away. You know, to Rocky and Bowling. Yes. She did the voice. Incredible. So it sort of comes together, but you know, the interesting part to me, it is Andy Griffith and Walt Disney, who are both really geniuses in their own way. I love both of those people. And you work Absolutely. with both of them. I work with both of them. You can shake my hand. Yes. I shook hands with Can I give you a hug? Oh. So great to meet you. It's a, and, Thank you for talking to me. my son is such a fan of yours. So we, have a whole, we have a circle here. All a circle the time. of friendship you that we're developing. Well, you betcha. Well, he's off with me to uh, Mayberry, to you Mount the, Airy. You're going to North Carolina. Yes, right. and he's going to um, perform. You play the guitar? I do. Oh, Very cool. I do. I'll have, to look that, I'll have to look that song up. Is it on? Is it on the internet? I've been withholding it. Oh, I don't have it. We won't get I'm any spoilers here. I want to say to everybody, because Tinkerbell must is part of my contract. It's faith, trust, and a whole bunch of pixie dust. And keep on doing what you do. I will. You promise? Yeah. Yeah, I'll come, I'll come and get you if you don't. I'm going to let I'll her know if stuff. I'll keep you to that. Okay. It's good to have inspiration from Tinkerbell. Thank you for the interview. Inside they have a model of nature's wonderland. Check this out. How awesome. This is incredible. This was not here last time I showed up. These rocks here in the middle might look familiar to you because after this attraction, went away they use those for the area where they used to have the goats the little petting zoo area of course all that's been replaced now in hopes and preparation for star wars land i am now boarding a bus i have randomly been invited on a continuation of a tour a mule came to the spot near a big rock and he tripped the autronic eye that caused the uh, sheep to jump sheep jumped and uh, so did the mule when he got jumped at You're listening to the swing. voice of Bob Gurr, who is narrating the, river and he pulled the trip. All the We're just following along. We're along for the ride, and Roscoe and Soul Train is here as well. So, uh, in fact, he's been helping me film a little bit today, again. so, so thanks, that was my thanks best to Roscoe. Animation. The third window up here is where uh, I was, was a designer from about, oh boy, 65 to 1980. So this is pretty much my home here. Why does it have lettering? What does it say? Airport? What's it say? No, what's it say? I think it says air terminal. Okay. Oh. There's an air terminal. Look right there. Look. Yeah. This is a runway. This used to be the runway of Grand Central Air Terminal. How many people have been out to LAX? Did you know this was LAX in 1930? Really? Uh, <laughs> this was the airport servicing Southern California. First scheduled flight in America, uh, Glendale to New York City, with another one starting in New York City coming this way, and they would cross in the middle of the country. Uh, Captain Charles Lindbergh was the pilot. Oh, my gosh. The airline industry started here. I lived two streets over behind this building and by the time I was eight or nine years old my mother knew that I was hopeless about a curiosity looking at everything. We had railroad steam trains. I'd run out and look at the steam trains in the afternoons going by. I'd come over to the airport all by myself. I'd just run across the street and go over there and she, she was just like, oh, Robert's going to run off someplace. This was filled with airplanes. Airplanes would come and go and people in fancy cars would show up in front of that building. And I was just like, oh man, this is, this is the most exciting thing going on. And then uh, by 1980, finished up with that building. I am, they moved me down here to that, that last corner building, that, the, the window, that's my office, for one year. And then at the end of that year, they fired me. But this building, I hung around as a little kid. I even saw Wrong Way Corrigan come and go wrong way. I saw Howard Hughes here. Even one of our buildings further down where we did our uh, prototype and, and production planning and the manufacturing for like wait, for the people mover cars, every kind of thing, was in the same hangar where Howard Hughes built his H1 land speed record airplane, which is now in the Smithsonian. I lived over here. My mother would give me a ride on the merry ground when Walt would bring his daughters to the merry ground. So I'm not just giving a tour. I'm telling two stories. You're reliving your childhood yeah. as well. 
Oh, well, sometimes it's too emotional. Um, on the merry-go-round, same way. I mean, that's just, I'm eight years old when I ride that. Yeah. I got this little uh, cigarette cough, which part of it was a real cigarette cough, but it had this little double, double cough-like thing, which was uh, like an early warning, like 10 seconds before he walked through your door, he'd be in the hallway, and you'd get this little <coughs> And it was like, oh my God, clean that, clean up your act. Here comes Walt. He's coming in any second now. And he'd just walk in. Sometimes he wouldn't say anything. Sometimes he'd uh, get in a big conversation. But usually it was a case he's going to uh, see what you're doing. And your ideas were always changing and improving. His ideas were improving and changing. And this was the essence of how Walt Disney got so much done so fast. You're constantly thinking about everything. This bus has a bathroom. It's a bathroom. Give you a tour. They know all the history because it's been taught. Right in the script. To find an animal in a natural world who can create not just a big mess of stuff, but create something that actually has an artistic uh, component, such as composition of objects, selection of objects. I caught a picture of him one day. He was selecting flowers in my backyard. He was trimming the stems a certain way and then taking them away and uh, do some of his artwork. There's a little story about here. I researched uh, these. Uh, it's, it's called a wood rat. This is called the larger uh, wood rat, indigenous to Southern California. He would, on my garage floor, he would go get articles that are natural articles out of the yard and he would make compositions strangest thing this is not helder skelter this is positioning things remember now he's doing this edge on but we're looking at it this way so people suggest why don't you photograph that and i took a whole bunch of photographs of his best work and then i kind of photoshop it put a little frame on it's it it's a simple composition he's got a main stem theme that I'm going through here but next to it in this curve he found a piece that's got that curve and he cuts them and he trims the edges. And then he signs it with this little piece of wheat or whatever it is. That's his hallmark. I mean, that is not random stuff. I mean, he has to think about this. I've also found that if I interrupt his pattern, I think he gets very upset. He goes next door, he gets dried uh, dog poop, and then he puts it on my floor. <laughs> uh, if he gets really mad, he'll put it on the step into my house. Uh, and then he won't do anything for two or three days. And I've, so I experimented many, many times with, um, if I interrupt him, i prove that that animal has emotions. You can actually upset it. So it's almost like artists are like that. You can actually uh, upset them in subtle ways. Or sometimes I'd give him three little kernels of a peanut and then I wouldn't. Then he'd get mad and I'd go back to the dog poop. I want to be known. I want to make, I want to be a friend. But if I'm visible, I'm, I'm extremely vulnerable. So for a few seconds at a time, he would show up in my uh, back patio, uh, just sort of quiver and look at me. One day, with a friend sitting there, he got closer, and he ran over, and he sniffed my shoe and ran away as fast as he could go. And I would hear him running along the shelves. If I go east, he goes east. If I go back, he goes the other way. Like following me, let me know he's there. Well, people would look at the artwork. I had Tony Anselmo, you know, as Donald Duck. And he says, Bob, he's following uh, Mr. Graham's uh, articles of uh, composition. He would show me about articles of three, things like that. And I says, yeah, that, that, that's what he's doing. And it's natural. It's not, uh, I'm not helping. He's not making that. He's been doing all that stuff himself. And a fascinating thing. I've studied it on the Internet, everything I can learn about so there's it. There's a lot, of, lot we don't know about animals. But to find out, number one, he's creative. Number two, he has emotional responses. I mean... Think of that. Animals that actually have emotions. It's incredible. And he's a rat. And he's a rat. Remember, Walt Disney had a mouse. Mortimer. Was an, yeah, it was an inspiration. You know, he'd have little pictures on the desk and stuff. But Walt's mouse never did a thing physically for him. I have a rat <laughs> that does physical work that I work with him. I mean, this is so absurd. There's that difference between Walt's mouse and Bob's rat. Interesting. www.apendisneyproducts.com. It's an honor to be riding in the Gurmobile. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're known for all the transportation stuff that you've created, and now I'm, well, I'm in the I, uh, the passenger seat. I'm a motorhome. 
Class C motor home. Oh, I really? Love, I love to go off for a ride. I have a Class C also. Really? What kind? The Ford chassis. It's called the Majestic series. Okay, the, tw the 24 footer. That is, that configuration is exact. It has just enough kitchen counter, just enough sink, bed in the right rear corner That's usually, it. and then the uh, dinette makes up. It's the most practical. Where's your favorite place to drive and, and camp at and, and oh, go off to? Almost anywhere. Sometimes I'll do short trips like Lake Paris, you know, because I can bike out there. Sometimes go out to the beach. Uh, just got back from a trip from Burning Man up there. You went to Burning Man? Well, I've been there four uh, times. As far as Burning Man goes, is it easy to find a spot to park? I've thought about going out there myself. You don't dare go unless you research it and know what you're getting in. It's hard to describe. It's, uh, it's so much trouble and it's so full of dust and bad weather. But you have to think like a burner, and if you understand that, then it's okay. Think like a burner? Yeah, what does that, that mean exactly? You're, that you're a burner. You go to Burning Man. You're a burner. I mean, this is... It's a cult you can't explain, but everybody knows what it is. Type in Burning Man and type in Bob Gert. And that's my 2010 Burning Man video. So we'll get to see, we'll get to see the other side of Bob Gert. <laughs> the, the, the burner, the burner side. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the stuff that the stuff that was published on the internet. Right, right. <laughs> the first characteristic of a wood rat is kleptomania. Really? I would test them that if I have my materials set where I normally keep them, then he can steal them. But if he stole it and made something, and I take it and rearrange it and set it in another place for his convenience, he will not touch them. Switch vehicles once again, and now I'm back in the Soul Train mobile. Special thanks to Ross for filming some of the festivities of the day. You never really know how something is going to play out when you wake up in the morning. It was a, it was an interesting it was an interesting day. One of a kind experience, I'd say that. See you guys tomorrow. Sugar gun 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 gun. Fuck. Oh fair.